Welcome to another episode of Simon Says, where facts come first. I'm your host, Jenny Simon, and thank you once again for joining us on Simon Says. We'll take a quick break and come right back to the meat of the matter. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Welcome back. Today I want to talk about corruption. And the reason being, it's raging out there. And I believe some of us believe that corruption is only when an investor come in, we, 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 we give them monies from the CBI program to build whatever they say they're building, be it hotel, be it trim farm, fall farm, and they disappear with the money. That, that's corruption. Oh, yo, yo, corruption. Oh, no. That's, that, that, that's corrupt. That type of corruption is not even our corruption. Those criminals that come in, of course, we sold passports to them, but they're the corrupt ones, right? But before I continue on the corruption, I want to tell you or give you the meaning of corruption so you understand that there are numerous, plenty corruption taking place in Grenada as we speak from the top to the bottom. So here we go. Corruption is a form of dishonesty or a criminal offense, which is undertaken by a person or an organization which is entrusted in a position of authority in order to acquire illicit benefits or abuse power for one's personal gain. I want you to bear that in mind. And, 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 and when you're looking at it after the program, you could easily scroll back and see what corruption means as we go along. Now, very early in the game, right off the bat, the, uh, the prime minister, the Honorable Deacon Mitchell spoke of inadequate salaries for ministers of government will breed corruption. I am not sure if, if I might be wrong, I stand corrected, but this might have even been before they came into office. But right there, right very early in the game, we saw this clip with him speaking of um, inadequate salaries and giving, and, and, and which could breed corruption, right? Actually telling them that this low salary you're only getting, you're only bound to thief, basically. You know, they're they, they, they bound to. And um, I was paraphrasing there, right? So I give you a chance to hear him for yourself. This is what he had to say in his own words. The salaries, it might be woefully inadequate. And what that means is that you, you almost create a situation where people are vulnerable um, and, and, and therefore you find a situation where the corruption and so on can happen easy. Because if you're going to give persons a very demanding job to do, and there's no doubt that being a government minister or an MP is a demanding job, and then you provide the state provides little or no or very inadequate resources to allow them to do that job, then you're almost facilitating the process where people are going to uh, be, be weak, be vulnerable, and they, they find themselves uh, making decisions that they should not do. However, if you create an environment where persons um, are paid well, they're given the resources, um, then you, you certainly would be minimizing the risk of corruption. And um, if it does happen, then there certainly should be dire consequences for them because they, they would have no, no excuses. I take that back. This here might have been him justifying the first raise the ministers got because that definitely is after he became prime minister 
of Grenada. And that was just, I think it was five or six days after coming into office, they got their first raise of $2,000. Call it what you want, transportation, whatever. It going in their pocket, it's this, it added to their salary, and they got a $2,000 raise. A few months later, in October of 2022, in a sit down with one of our, um, our own journalists, Calistra Ferrier, he again spoke of or linked corruption to low salaries. This is what he had to say then. One of the issues we have to address as a society, and I'm going to quote the uh, now deceased great former leader of Singapore. If you want government on the cheap, you will get cheap government. Part of the challenge we face here in Grenada, if you look at what government ministers work for, we can even compare it to the judiciary. Judges make fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars, perhaps up to twenty thousand dollars when you add benefits and allowances. Do you know what government ministers work for? They work for six thousand dollars. With a $2,500 transportation allowance, that's the only reason they up the $8,000 or whatever it is, the, the, the figure is. Right? Some may argue that there are people in the country who work harder than ministers. Yeah, but, but probably. Maybe. Who go home with $1,500 a month. It's quite possible. And make and, it work. I know our job is obviously to try and improve the overall GDP or income per capita of all Grenadians. But we also cannot be naive. If you pay the people who are leading the country and who have access to the state resources on the cheap, you are running the risk of corruption. That is the reality. Because let us not pretend being the prime minister, being a minister of government and being an MP is not an easy job. And we could try and fool ourselves and suggest that it is. It is not. How does that become a reality? A reality, he said. So we always hear Grenada have... Um, the lowest salary rate in the Caribbean, and you have some people working very hard on a daily basis and going home with what we might say is penis. Are we encouraging that? Are we saying to them, you're working hard for measly salary, we, you, the, your company is encouraging corruption? The Prime Minister trivialized $8,500 or $8,050. He said they were getting $6,000 with 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 twenty five hundred, yeah, eight thousand five hundred, with with twenty five hundred for transportation. Added to that is eight thousand. He trivialized eight thousand five hundred dollars, which all previous administrations used. As I understand it, when um the NDC of two thousand and eight came into office, some of the cabinet members they you know lobbied for a raise in in, in salary. And the then Prime Minister Tillman Thomas said, no way. The economy is bad. We have so much going on. Remember, they came in. Um, Ivan was, had just gone a few years ago, and Grenada was still catching up itself, although the administration before did their best in, 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 in trying to get us back on our feet. Of course, they lost the election in, in 2008. So we had that to do. And the Prime Minister said, if my memory served me right, at one time, the prime minister even had some of the members, if not all of them, agreed to take a cut in their salary. And what you heard from ministers of government from before, they spoke of service. When you get into politics, that's the first thing that should be in your mind. I wouldn't say that is in your mind because it's not for everybody. And it seems as though we pick up a set of bag, people here always will have a sack waiting to shove money down inside of it. Big, 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 big estimates calling, you know, for two block two balloons and, and they're hearing about $17,000, right? Amongst them, yeah, yeah. Because everybody have a business now and everybody's business is getting business through the government of Grenada, right? So, um, and, and they spoke about serving their country. But of course, um, it may not have been this bad ever at all with people coming into the cabinet, owing everybody in town, owing the, the financial um, in, um, institutions um, millions, 
and um, the rest broke, right? But whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? Is that you have that slate, right? It didn't matter who you pick up and put in because you're the leader, you're Deacon Mitchell, you're the best, best lawyer. And so you made it and you managed to fool the Grenadian people. And so now the backlash is on, right? So we know that a week or so after, as I said, before they got the 2000, then 18 months later, they got another 5,000. And added to that, as an MP, they collected a $10,000 a month for their constituency. I'm happy with that. But those are the things that breed corruption. As a matter of fact, from the last sitting, we were told that $30,000 went on their accounts for their constituency. Hmm, 30,000 because the retroactive government had to retroact because they didn't, they didn't give them from January as they said they would. So by March, they had to give them, when they finally got to where they wanted to be, they had to give them $30,000. That is what breeds corruption, when you have the money to play with, right? So as I said before, there are those who came in broke. There are those who came in owing all suppliers, all, all um, uh, uh, agencies in town, in the country, out of the country. There are those who or financial institution, the Prime Minister knew very well about that particular individual who he went into, into, cooperation, into cooperation with. It was a corporate, um, the, the fall farm, and uh, pull out of it. And, and that kind of, even during the campaign, when the, when, the, when the candidates were called, and when um, Philip Tellisford was, was named to be on the, 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 the slate, with the, the Beacon Mitchell, that gave me another hmm. Because we, some of us knew of what the, the talk of war that went on between them. I'm not sure if it reached court, but the, the, the fact is he got back his money that he had invested in, Phyllis, in Philip Tellersford for from him and, and the rest of the, of the investors, apparently, all of the investors pulled out and left him with um, a shell and he had to borrow to pay, pay them back their monies. And that's why we ended up with the big um, millions owing to one of the financial institutions in St. George's. So we had all these people accused um, and, and allegedly owing, and who owing, not just allegedly, but some we had the facts, right? And uh, it resulted in what we have today. Now we had uh, our acting prime minister. He might be, a, I'm not sure, they said the prime minister was due to return today. I'm not sure at what point, but um, he was acting for a, a couple of weeks. He acted as, as prime minister. And... Um, this guy, as I said before, time and time again, but I will continue to bring it to you as long as he continue to be in our cabinet and in our parliament, and as long as he continue to be our acting prime minister, right? He aided and abetted and abetted in what resulted in a number of young people just before the elections while campaign was going on to lose their jobs in a company here in Grenada that sells chicken to uh, corner stores, shops and, 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 and supermarkets and so. 
Then there is the port scandal. Then there is the port scandal. But, but let me make a step back. This company, he still owes over a hundred, almost a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But they're, they're transformers. So they whispering, they, they're talking about it quietly behind the doors. And the, the workers know of it and the workers talking about it because they hear them whispering, right? Moving along. The suppliers that he owes, the suppliers that he owes, mainly are from giving bounce check for goods received. He received the goods, he write a check, he pay a pain, and the check would bounce. In our books, that is a crime. It is a crime. What are we telling our young people? That it's okay to do stuff like that, not fix it, and you can still end up in the cabinet and in the parliament of Grenada because our people are blinded by one person, one actor in the movie. And so it don't matter who the others are. But today it's showing up that the actor, one actor can do a whole movie. We need supporting actors and actresses. We need actress, we need supporting actresses, right? And, and, and other people, we need all kinds of people. Sometimes we just need people to sit down or walk past when a movie is it's being filmed to make the thing real. So reality hits home that he alone cannot do it. And there are those of you who are still ignoring that fact. And whenever there's an issue, you push him aside and say the prime minister ain't know what happened and the prime minister hands full and the prime minister needs help and the prime minister needs better advisors and the rest of the guys you school them on that train not even bus under the train and the train would roll over them and you don't care especially those of you in the diaspora you do not care imagine our acting prime minister name was up on the bad pay list that the government has put up in their cash offices to say, do not remove, do not accept checks from this individual or this organization, right? When they came into office, he was already being put as acting prime minister. It, the list was still up. And when people start talking about it, they pulled it down, remove his name. But did he pay up these bills? We, we need to know. He, if he paid, tell us. Tell us. Because he is acting as our prime minister, as our prime minister for the most part. And I come back to the, 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 the um, Port Saga when an officer was, was fired from the from the port for corruption allegedly so because you know what they had to bring her back when the port the, the workers at the port dropped tools they had to bring her back how can you have an alleged accomplice sitting in the highest office one of the highest office of the country, the cabinet of Grenada and the parliament of Grenada. And you firing the officer. It can't work, it don't work so. So they had to take her back. I don't think they put her back on the port, but they had to rehire her. They had to rehire her. Listen, I could go on on this one character for weeks when it comes to the corruption 
the fraudulent behavior, the criminal acts, all after he was minister, he been writing bounce checks. I could go on, but we, but, but we need to talk some more about some other folks. We would still like to know, though, before I get off him, the house that he supposedly had in GDB as collateral, the one in Mount Parnassus, we would like to know how that house got sold and why and who sold it and why and where's the money? <laughs> because if you own the GDB over $3 million, it has to be that whatever that house costs, the, the, the GDB is supposed to collect. I'm still hearing that he's not financing his loan at the GDB. But if that is not corruption, what is? His house that's supposed to be as collateral and in the GDP, not supposed to be, we have the documents to show. I still have them. The document, I showed it to you on this program already. That says the house, he has a house in Mount Parnassus and that's part of the collateral along with his parents' house in the line and two lots of land in St. David's, which cannot meet up the $3 million. Huh? But he had some collateral and the house was there and the house got sold. And how is it just three months, six months, I'm sorry, after he became minister and owing the development bank over $2 million, he was able to receive a loan, a $300,000 loan under the MSME program. And MSME, my people, means micro, small, and medium enterprise, CMSME. It's a support fund program of the government of Grenada and the Grenada Development Bank. Immediately, according to the, the, the laws of the bank, it scratched off all ministers of government and their family, uh, siblings, parents, oh, scratch off the list. They are not allowed funds from the Grenada Development Bank. Six months in December of 2022, he received the $300,000, right? With a 1% interest pay, re, um, repayment. If that is not corruption, what is? Because we all know, those of you playing, they only know, y'all know too, that he only received that money because his party is in office, the chairman of the board is a member of the executive of the 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 um executive of the party, the NDC party. She's the treasurer of the party. She's also the an advisor to the prime minister, who is head of the cabinet. Corruption? Are we are we here smelling it? Moving on to Senator Lacret and his $1.7 million loan given to him for a mortgage at the same Grenada Development Bank. Off the bat, corruption. He's not supposed to receive monies from the Development Bank. This man was a teacher. He was a principal. He went worked in the, in the, in the Ministry of Education. He then worked in private sector. How come he didn't get a million, $1.7 million from... GDB or a commercial bank for a mortgage, all of a sudden, as the Grenadians we say, all at a sudden, he getting loan eh? because the NDC board is set up inside inside the development bank and just doing all sorts of wrong things with our monies corruption corruption right another cabinet member 
Lennox Andrew. God alone from the GDB secured over a weekend. From Friday to Monday, money in the bank for his daughter to go to study in the UK. Allegedly so. Now, corruption. Like it or not, these people are not supposed to be touching our money in the Grenada Development Bank. And they're only getting it because, and I'm saying it again, the chairman of the board, among all of the others on the board, are NDC supporters. A fisherman I heard calling on the program. He didn't speak to me. I heard him on a radio program calling in to say he went to the development bank to get a loan for to buy a new trawler, boat, engine, everything. And they told him he could only get $30,000. He said that would have covered, I guess, the, the, the boat itself. But the engine, the engine is another $40,000, according to what he said. And they told him he could only get $30,000. A fisher folk. When Morris Bishop, who we idolize so much, and the, and, 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 and the revolution, the NJM, Brought in the brought the development bank. It was to help farmers and fisher folks. We ain't like Morris no more when it comes to giving our people money. It don't matter. We go just dive into the development bank. A young entrepreneur went to the development bank for twenty five thousand dollars. There. Collateral came up $5,000 short. The bank told her in order to get the $2,500, she'd have to put up the extra $5,000 cash before if she want that, or else she just have to take $20,000. And we're giving our ministers millions Millions without proper security. The application in no way would give them the loan because of all they have owing. Or, well, we know the deal when you go to the, most of us, when you go to the bank and they say, well, we can't give you the loan because you're already stretched in and you can't, or you need security for that amount of money. But a, lit, a young person trying to make it. But we hear, we continue to hear the old talk. I want you to hear this clip. One, One of the ways we are doing that is addressing our lending institutions, institutions like the Grenada Development Bank, Bank which we say on an NEC will be focused on the productive sectors. GDB should be the ones giving loans to fishermen. GDB should be the ones giving loans to our farmers. GDB should be the ones giving loans to our agro-processors. GDB should not be involved in giving loans to buy vehicles. Or frankly, to even buy homes. That is for commercial and retail banking. You are a development bank. Your job is to back and support our businessmen and women who are the ones that will provide the employment to our fellow Grenadians so that they can go and get a loan from a commercial or retail bank. And so, and so that's, that's one, one of the, the focus, focus that we, we want to make sure that we streamline the activities both of the Grenada Industrial and Development Corporation and the Grenada Development Bank into supporting our local businessmen, particularly in the productive sectors. Because if we don't produce things... You see how he, 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 he takes us a, a, a pull up when it comes before he say uh, for mortgages? <laughs> he wonder, should I say that or should I not? Because... One of our, our people just get loaned for, for a mortgage. Should I say mortgage? Yeah, say it. Say it for a fact. They should not be given mortgage, you mortgage loans. And 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 that's kind of person. Two, you saying that to ordinary people, much less ministers of government, which is against the laws 
of the bank. This is against the laws of the bank. Run Redhead. We're going to run Redhead because he was a part of the of the, the cabinet. He was a part of the government. He was a, in the parliament of Grenada. And to me, he's still a part of the government. We come to that. We come to that. Eight months in office, he sold a car that did not belong to him. And the check was written in his name and he kept the money. And the only how we knew the story was because he couldn't do the transfer. He didn't smart enough to know that. He couldn't transfer the vehicle to the gentleman he sold it to after he collected the man's check. He dodged in the man because he couldn't transfer the vehicle. He must have gone to the owner to get the transfer. But we all know that story. What bothered me about this story the most was that the prime minister found out on the weekend, what that particular weekend in March, March 2023, about the, about this, well, of course, the story starts spinning around. I woke up on Facebook and everybody was talking about. And uh, so he called the owner of the vehicle to get the full story, which she gave him. Yes, she lent him the car and he sold the car without her knowledge. And this gentleman is calling her now to come to the bank, to the Inland Revenue, to transfer the vehicle to him. And she's saying to him, I have no money. I don't know my car was, was sold because I did not receive any monies. And she had, her car was, she had given an estimate of $18,000 $18, for her car. She had received not a cent, right? The prime minister told her, okay, don't you worry. You get some of your money tomorrow, which was the Monday, and the balance you'll get by Wednesday. And indeed, so it was. She got some of the money and cash, cash on on, on Monday, um, the 8,000, I think, or the 10,000, whichever one she got, the Monday, I don't quite remember now. And um, the balance she got on the, when, on the Tuesday, as a matter of fact, they showed up in the dark, with the money, the balance, and she said, no, I'm not doing business like that on in the day, you know. And so come back on, on tomorrow morning, which they did, to Mr. Ron and his good buddy in Caraco, um, showed up with the cash as drug dealers for um, the lady, for the owner of her, for, for, the, for her car. Ron was fired almost a year later from the cabinet, allegedly, for stealing. It's encouraged. It's encouraged. Now, we hear the story, you hear the rumors, all sorts of things saying no there, because of course he's upset that he got fired. And it's allegedly saying there were others in there who did things similar and they're still sitting in the cabinet. Here this clip that the Honorable Ron Reddit, who held the position of Minister for State with responsibility for youth, sports and culture, uh, will demit office as a minister and he will remain obviously as the Member of Parliament for St. George North East. Uh, minister Reddit is doing so, so that he gets some time off from ministerial responsibility uh, to pursue his academic and educational pursuits we obviously take the opportunity to wish him well in this. We anticipate uh, that in the not too distant future, he will conclude uh, those academic pursuits and would be in a position, uh, if he so chooses, and if the prime ministers agree, to uh, have him rejoin the cabinet. Uh, so Not funny, not funny. The release from the prime minister's office said, Honorable Ron Redhead, role as minister for state, with responsibility for youth has been revoked. Now, the word demitted is as good, it means resign, right? That's one of the meaning, resign. Revoked means to take back or withdraw, annul, cancel, reverse, 
recent repeal, repeal, fired in other words, fired in other words. Is it true that members of your cabinet, sir, have been collecting monies from contractors in exchange for contracts? And that some collect money weekly, go to contractors, whatever they move, they have nothing to do with in the first place, to collect, to ask for cash, and to collect cash. Mafia style, bleeding contractors, making deals. I'm just asking, because I heard from a contractor, I just, and I, I don't believe it. I don't believe him. So I'm asking you, Prime Minister Deacon, head of the cabinet, is this true? Let's hear what you had to say in the parliament as you turn and look at the members on your side in the house. What you are driving at a point, which is, you have to serve the people. If you're hungry, moat. If you beggy, beggy. You can come and be parliamentarian. All kind of people come by you because they know you're hungry, moat. So you see, Mr. Speaker, your doctor, your professional, that's the point. Because you and I are professionals, we can serve and people can buy us. We can serve. That's not a fact. You could be doctor, you could be lawyer. If you want to be bought, you will be bought. But that's besides the point. They knocked the table. They knocked the table. Did you, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, do your due diligence? You and your team, you had a team that was picking your candidates. You had, they, they had to apply, you had interviews. Did you do your due diligence when you picked your candidates, when you picked your candidates, the ones that are sitting in the cabinet with you now who are hungry mouth and beggy beggy and can be bought? Did you do your due diligence and they knock the table? Is it true, Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell, the Grenadiers, the local contractor that had replaced the foreign company on the Molinet project, paid a member of the cabinet to get the contract? which they couldn't do the job. You yourself said they interfere with things they wasn't supposed to interfere with and juke down the mountain and cause more problems, more money to spend. And then you had to go and bring back the foreign company, I think it was from St. Lucia, I stand corrected. But the foreign company to do the work that they were sent away from. And then there is this, the veteran journalist, Stanley Charles, who most of you, some of you might have seen, I wouldn't say most because he was on, on, on um, Center Run and WhatsApp on the weekend, who told us that there is corruption in the government, in the cabinet, and that your prime minister know about it and that you would be taken care of you be taking care of it on your return from Cuba. You didn't stay on the ground long enough to take care of that problem. But we hope that when you return, because he said you'd be a changed man. Right? I, I didn't say that. I want you guys to hear it. Those of you who haven't heard it, this is what the gentleman, veteran journalist Tandy Charles, had to say. It's the Iceman. At this time, normally I'm in bed or, or going to bed because, as you know, I get up very early and do the things I have to do. But I have to tell you this because it may break, it may not, but the people who need to know are fully aware. 
there is a situation where a chairman of a board, I'm not going to say which board, the chairman of a board is having sex with one of the employees. It's sex. It's nothing to do with love or romance. It's your sex. And basically taking advantage of the young woman. But the young woman, she needs a job. So it's sex. This is like bad as sex for toilet. Now, along with that, there's been a recent issue in Grenville linked to what is called the recreation ground. That is, uh, I think its official name is Victoria Park. And inside there, we've come very close to a form of embezzlement that caused cause, cause great concern. I am reliably informed that the Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell was so pissed off he personally intervened and saved the day. So much so that people are predicting when he returns to the country he would be a change man because of what he's learned and what he's seen that is happening. That some of his people are wayward. There's also, I have to say, an allegation that one of the ministers, you know, maybe misguided me because I haven't got the, the, the facts, that he gave a three-room bedroom house, a three-bedroom house, to a woman who is a friend of his wife. And it turns out the woman is a key supporter of the NNP. I'm telling you, I understand that the Prime Minister flipped. So these things are happening and, and they don't appear to make sense. How come the NDC seems to be so volatile? So it appears that the, the Prime Minister has had enough and may act in a way that may cause the public to fully understand that this guy, who is not a politician, has been under pressure because he inherited a group of people who, like him, expressed intention to want to see change in the country. And it perhaps hurts him, that is Deacon Mitchell, that some of these people are totally incompetent and asking them to run a ministry is like asking me to climb Everest. It's virtually impossible. You know, or Kilimanjaro, impossible. Now, as I say, I'm reliably informed that when we see the Prime Minister next, when he speaks or whatever, he would be a change man. And that means that some of the people, and they, a decision has already been made, some of these people, while they will not be kicked out of the party, they will not be chosen to be candidates in the next election, despite the government standing, whether it has a good chance or not. Well, Mr. Charles, uh, the Iceman, we await, because you know the Prime Minister was only in transit. He overnighted and left the next day. So let's wait until he comes back, see how long he's on the ground for. If we hear anything or see any changes taking place. The cannabis saga. It's been something that I've been, I've been following for a while. And I thought that it's time I bring it to you. Recently, it was revealed that we now have a brand new cannabis committee. Chaired by learned attorney Anselm Cloud. So let's take a few steps backwards. Uh, the previous commission was constituted in September 2022, contracted for one year, which came to an end in September 2023. It just dissolved. We heard nothing about it for a while until now when they hired, they are appointed a new committee, not a commission. It's called a committee this time. 
In speaking to a former member of the previous committee, Rasta Michael Batiste, in his own words, he said, the commission was swallowed up. So I asked, I said, well, what happened, you know, in that, with that commission? Where did you all get? What, 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 what? He said, basically nothing happened. The commission was swallowed up. He said they did not get the support they needed from the relevant authorities. He said the chairperson of the commission, Ms. Rolanda McQueen, did not receive the support or, or and the cooperation from members of the commission, especially the deputy chairman of the commission, Mr. Vincent Roberts. The commission, um, he said, in fact, they worked against her in some instances. Speaking to other members of the commission, whose name I cannot call, I would um, ask me not to call, uh, spoke of members working against the chairman or without her knowledge decision being made without her knowledge, and in some cases, not just her, but the rest of the commission. Most of them hardly attended meetings. In speaking to other members, the Minister of Agriculture, nor the Attorney General did, supported the commission. Neither of them supported the commission the ministers and the minister and the PS in agriculture both attended the meeting once, a meeting once. I'm not sure if it's together or both of them once separately. The AG attended none, and she did not respond to correspondence, to emails of none of the sort. There was no correspondence from the AG. Speaking to a member, another member of the commission, he too do not want to be named. I was told that the chairperson wasn't liked because she wasn't willing to squander the $500,000, half a million, allocated to the commission. A consultant was engaged without knowledge of the chairperson and some members of the commission, um, and some members of the commission for a fee of US dollars 60,000. And I was told um, that person was engaged by the deputy chairman of the commission. The chairperson, with the backing of other members, turned down that arrangement. There was also a story of a contract almost ready to sign for an office space. Arrangements mean be made with the owner and the chairperson through the secretary of the um, commission at the time or assistant, if you want to say that. And um, they received a call from the gentleman, the owner of the of the of the space, who claimed that someone called or showed up to say that they come for their commission for this for the space. Now this person was saying that they were the one who got the space for the cannabis commission. And if you know anything about real estate, that person is entitled to get sometimes um, a, a month, a month um, rental payment for doing that. And uh, they do it differently, but you get a percentage of something or whatever. So this person showed up to say that they, to the owner, not knowing how we know, because according to members, he was not responsible for receiving, for, for getting them the space. There were some members, I was told, who were adamant that he should be paid as well. That's quashed. 
they forget about the, the, the renter with the contract because, as I was told, the chairperson said that she wasn't going to have that. And that also squashed. That was denied. Attempts of corrupt practices. Attempts of corrupt practices. Remember, remember what corruption means. So you know how we do it uh, at Simon Says? I called up and spoke to the deputy chairman. His name was coming up a lot. And I, and, um, who I told, whom I was told resigned after he couldn't have his way. That's what I was told. I called him up, the deputy chairman, Mr. Vincent Roberts, and we had a conversation. Very cordial. Vince is my friend. And he told me, well, he denied, as a matter of fact, he denied the allegations, especially the one of not supporting and cooperating with the chairperson. He said to me that he um, chaired, as deputy chair, he chaired a couple of meetings when um, the chairperson was not available. And to him, he thought things were going cordial. He claimed his resignation came because meeting time was changed to accommodate a member of the team. And that time was not suited for him. It was clashing with other activities he had going on. And so he had to resign. And he said he had a lot, a lot of other things going on and the pressure was too much. And so he resigned. He knew nothing of the arrangement with the, for the US dollars, 60,000 US dollars arrangement for the, consul, the consultant. And so I moved on. I also contacted the previous chairperson of the commission, whom I was told as well at some point had handed in her resignation to the Minister of Agriculture, Adrian Thomas, and her resignation was not accepted. So I brought this all to her. Ms. McQueen did admit handing in her resignation, and um, but when further question on matters, um, some of which I, I, I was repeating from other members and asking questions of the commission and what happened and why nothing happened as some, some members said, and, and um, it dissolved, we heard nothing. And then we just heard of a new committee. When I mentioned this new committee, Ms. McQueen said she knew nothing of it. It was the first she was hearing of a new committee, and she had no further comments. The new six-member committee comprises of Tonya Alexander, Dr. Sean Charles, Josh Hector, ACP Vanny Cohen, Rasta Aiton Alexander, and Attorney Anselm Clowden as the chairman. The committee worked to be completed within six months as established by the cabinet. And um, I guess so we await. Now, as I understand it from members of the previous committee, no consultations was held with the general public, with the people, and they basically ended where they started. According to the former deputy chairman, Vincent Roberts, around the time of his resignation, there was a draft legislation prepared by attorney Anselm Clowden, who, by the way, became the new deputy chairman after Mr. Vincent Roberts resigned. The draft legislation was about to be presented to Attorney General Claudette Joseph. Speaking of Claudette Joseph, I had the opportunity to speak to a young professional in the cannabis industry, a Trinidadian, Marcus Ramkisun. This gentleman, as he told me, wrote the laws for Trinidad, Antigua, St. Kitts, officially. That is the cannabis laws to deal with the cannabis and whatever. 
Unofficially, he said he did for Barbados, Jamaica, and St. Vincent. As I understand it, Mr. Ramkison was in talks with the previous Cannabis Commission, so I contacted him. His name came up. I used my resources, got a contact for him, and I contacted him. He admitted engaging the Cannabis Commission here in Grenada, chaired by Ms. Rolanda McQueen, during, um, during or coming to the end of that commission stint, he was told by a gentleman, he told me, who walked in his office and told him, knowing, I guess, that he, Mr. Ramkison, was engaging the Cannabis Commission in Grenada and probably, and, and not probably, not to monopolize, but to put them on the right track as he did with other islands and move on. Get you get payment for what he did his, and, and his consultation and whatever. And so that might have reached this person and he said the person showed up at his office and told him that he was given the monopoly of the Grenada cannabis industry. To him, he said he saw corruption. He said the chairman of, when he contacted the chairman of the commission, that is the former commission, she knew nothing about this person and no one monopolizing. She knew nothing of the sort. Mr. Ramkison said, from what the gentleman told him and showed him, he actually showed him photographs of meetings with members of the Grenada government. And this is according to Mr. Ramkison. I have not seen any photos. Let me make it quite clear. He said, he showed him, what he showed him, he saw alleged corruption. I am putting alleged in front of it. He said, alleged corruption stemmed from the government, calling one name, the Attorney General called it, while he said he'd hold back on the others, because he told me, when we were speaking, I mentioned to him that there's a new commission now, and that Ms. because he asked of the, the old commission and Mr. Queen, I told him there was a new commission name, and he said, well, since that is so, he would contact the attorney general and speak to her of the information he had concerning this monopolization and to see if they can move on. He said, so he would hold back on the other names until such time. He has since tried to contact the attorney general since he learned of the formation, as I said, of the new committee. Um, he said, I spoke to him a couple of days ago. He said he has not been able to reach us yet. He spoke to a secretary or assistant um, and, and um, told her, he told her what he told me, everything that he knew and what was going on and that he would like to meet with her or speak with her. He is yet to get um, a reply or any sort of um, answer from the Attorney General herself. Mr. Ram Ramkison is fully qualified in his field. He sent me a 14-page CV. I mean, he has his US accredited. He has Master of Science and degree in Cannabis Science and Commerce. I mean, it just, he, uh, the list is long. This list, it would take up the rest of my program if I have to read his um, his CV. He has Masters of Business Administration, MBA. He has Masters of Science, MSc in Project Management, um, Doctorate in, in, in Psychology, Medical Cannabis Master. Um, I mean, you just name it in, in that industry as well. He seemed very qualified for the job.
as consultant. In the meantime, um, cannabis, marijuana is still illegal in Grenada, in the books, and um, Rasta, Rasta Batiste and his group uh, decided to, to show up at, a, at a, 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 some sort of display, some, some sort of thing, I don't know what it was, at the stadium with a marijuana tree, and the police swooped down on them. Take a look at this. During the official opening of Christmas Market on Friday, members of the Rastafari Organization for Centralization had a booth to display cannabis products as part of their sensitization on the cannabis plant and its uses. The members had an unprocessed cannabis plant with them at the time, which prompted members of the Royal Grenada Police Force to swoop into the booth to question the members. The police officers questioned whether the ROC members had permission to display the plant so boldly. Representative from the ROC Michael Batiste said they got permission stemming from a conversation during last Tuesday's Senate debate. Well, I'm, I'm part of the commission, the, the, the Cannabis Commission, and we took that, um, that what's going on here now, that project is part of the commission project for the sensitization of marijuana in Grenada. And the sensitization is dealing with the, the products and all these things. So this Tuesday, we was in the Senate, myself and my brethren, and we gave them the message and they called and they said that, at, well, um, the senator called, I think Mr. Francois or somebody like that, and they said this was okay, that's why I come on the tree today. But he said they presented some points from a six month sensitization. While all this is happening, the Prime Minister is posing with the marijuana tree. We take a quick break and come right back. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Welcome back. Folks, there's corruption in the Lottery Authority. I mean, most of you must know that by now. The CEO of the authority and the chairperson of the board are in a personal relationship. They're lovers. That's conflict of interest, and it must breed corruption. Ah. Uh, the chairman of the board dropped an, off an invoice to the authority for new furniture for his office once he became the chairman from his company. He furnished the lottery or, or his office and he was on the board of the gravel and concrete where Sylvester Collis was chairman, is chairman. I'm saying words because in my head, we hear he going to, to Ottawa. We'll talk about that too. Um, um, where Qualis, Sylvester Qualis is the chairman and furnish that um, institution as well with furniture from his company. That is Mr. William Batiste. Now, this is a gentleman that was chairman of the board of the Lottery Authority when NDC came in an office in 2008 and was removed from his position um, by the Honorable Tillman Thomas at the time. I'm not quite sure the, um, the exact reason, but it was to do with fraudulent behavior, alleged fraudulent behavior. Lotto has hired the NDC sorry as HR consultant for the entity, paying uh, $5,000 a month. This individual has a full-time job at a large firm here in Grenada as HR manager and holds position on boards, at the boards of statutory body on the island. The Lottery Authority is still paying Ian Django Thomas for doing nothing in the Ministry of Youth. The new Minister of Youth and Sports said he doesn't need him as an advisor. He was advisor to his partner in crime, Honorable Ron Reddit at the time. And early in the game, 
he, met, he, he wrote a letter to this minister, the new minister, Jonathan Lopez, stating his case and asking to remain. The minister said he did not, he do not want any advisors, which includes uh, Patrick Simmons. And so they remain in the ministry. Apparently, um, Ian Django Thomas is just given a desk in the Ministry of Youth and Patrick Simmons is now in charge of the sports policy, I think. Job for the boys. That is corruption. That is corruption. We know that there was um, alleged widespread corruption during the 50th anniversary celebration and to date, the nation is yet to receive an account of the spendings of the $22.5 million allocated for that purpose. $1.5 million, we know, was spent on drones, and uh, our roads and bridges are out there now, shaky. We, they need fixing, they need redoing. Um, they're badly damaged from the freak bad weather we had during the 20, during 2023 and um, a hurricane season is around the corner and we complaining and we don't, they don't have the money says the, the Minister of Finance and um, they're asking us to pay $50 more on our license, license um, our driver's license fees so that they can get money to fix the roads and the bridges but we spend $1.5 million on drones. Nobody's speaking about the drones anymore. It, the day after, maybe the day after. Not even an eight days wonder we got this time. It's done. And the money gone. And now, with, the, with the hurricane season coming and the rain, and, and it's even if, I hope, pray to God, we don't get a bad hurricane or a storm, we're going to get the rains. We're going to get heavy rains. And the bridges... Our, most of our bridges, as I would, I think the Prime Minister mentioned it as well, need um, re reconstructed. We had wife hiring husband, brother hiring brother and sister-in-law and sister, sister-in-law collecting invoice in her name. Members of the NOC, the National Organizing Committee, own companies, their companies getting hired by themselves, members of the Secretariat, hiring themselves if that is not corruption what is we're going to leave the corruption thing for a moment because i could go on as i said weeks would i would be sitting here with things like that and others and it's going to come out i would bring it to you as time goes on in bits you know i heard the senator and minister for youth and sports who contested in the last election june 23rd, 2022, in the St. George Northwest constituency, in the evening news this past um, week, referring to himself as the representative for the people of St. George Northwest. And I said to myself, the audacity of this chap. Listen to what he had to say. Senator Jonathan Lacrette says that he was alerted of the fire by members of the Boussijou Northwest Council and thanked community members and the fire department alike for speedy support and response. He assured the public that the necessary assistance will be given. Fire initiated also the response of the St. George Northwest Emergency Response Team because we do have that team in place. And that team immediately began post-fire preparations for the family. Uh, the family lost everything. Uh, though distraught, no lives were lost. And for that, uh, I believe that everyone, we are eternally grateful. Uh, within 10 hours, the family was settled, very comfortable and is grateful for the intervention by uh, the team. So from my prime minister to my cabinet colleagues, the cabinet of ministers and the St. George Northwest Council for Human and Social Development, we want to empathize with the two families from Boucheju on the loss of their dwelling quarters and the possessions therein. We also want to let them know 
But as long as LACO is their representative, they have nothing to fear. And we will build back better. They can take that to the bank, Terry, and they can cash it. As long as LACO is their representative. You see, if you don't know, it's termed ignorance. But when you've been told, and so you know, and you ignore what you know, and continue to act foolhardy and in certain level with a certain level of insolence, that in my book is arrogance. On the 14th of December 2023, budget 2024, Senate budget debate day two in the morning session, this guy was made aware, if he didn't know then, of the fact that he is not the representative of St. George Northwest constituency, meaning you did not win your seat. And that the person, therefore, who won the seat, in this case, Dr. Keith Mitchell, is the representative of St. George Northwest. Here's the clip. Madam President, true constituency representation lies not in the voidness of narration, nor the spectacle of political theatrics but it lies in the humanity of being the people's voice, being the people's vindicator, and being the people's vanguard. Lapret 2023. Over the past 17 months, Madam President, my team and I have been consistently on the ground in St. George Northwest, week after week, month after month. And we recognize that in order for us to have the political gap bridge in that constituency, we must start by working together for the common good, and we must have a holistic approach towards representation. The next sentence I'm about to say, I make it with no apology because I was born and grown in the constituency and I worked there for 21 years as an educator teacher and principal. It is the constituency, above all constituencies, that has been badly divided by politics. Badly divided by politics. Anybody that's coming to bridge any gap has a lot of work to do. Together, Madam President, my team and I have formed the Council for Human and Social Development also known as the Council for St. George Northwest, with two representatives per community sitting on that council, ensuring that community development, community empowerment, and poverty eradication is their mandate at this particular point in time. Madam President, the council has a very strong focus on education in the constituency. In fact, so strong that we have adopted all of the schools in the constituency from primary to secondary. And to show our support to the educational thrust in the constituency on September 4th, when the new academic school year started, the council delivered in excess of $27,000 to every school. It was divided to the schools in that constituency. For those of you who had the opportunity to look at the news, you recognize that the principals were very elated because as a former principal, Madam President, starting school at the beginning of the new... Point of order. Thank you. Senator Cret, please yield. Senator... Andrew Lewis, take the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, well, everyone knows that I was not here yesterday, so I don't know if this matter was addressed and it was clarified. But I'm hearing a constituency report in Dundas and George is not West. And where I know, for instance, that um, I am I'm seeking 
to understand what is happening. I mean, I, I've certain a baffled. I spoke my colleagues here too, and as I said, I was not here yesterday, so I don't know. But um, I, I'm seeking, yes. So, yeah, I'm not I thought we were debating the budget in terms of um, minister, ministerial issues, I mean, constituency reports. Um, thank you. The It is a budget debate. Uh, I have noticed that different speakers will speak about what has been accomplished in their constituency under the conversation of the previous budget as it re and that achievement as it relates to the budget under consideration now. Yes, Senator. Please permit me. I'm not aware that we have constituency representatives in this house. I'm, I'm, I'll be guided by you, but I'm not aware. You see, I'm trying to ensure that we maintain a certain level of decorum. The Senate has been respected and has been identified has been different to the other place. And therefore, I think it is important for us to address issues very early. I am not aware that any one of us here, now, I have, I have constituents, not a constituency, I mean, I represent labor. But when we start speaking about the political divisions in terms of our islands are divided, in terms of constituencies, as far as I'm aware, this is for another place. If I yes. use a local colloquial. So I just thought I should, and I'll be guided by you. Thank you. I offer guidance to the to the minister, the senator, that his report will be made within the context of the rules of the Senate. Well, Madam President, on that note, it's a bit unfair because others that went before me had an opportunity to present on their constituency. That's the format that we took, that we present on our constituency in the first few minutes of our budget presentation and thereafter we start our budget debate. So I think that the precedence has already been set. I would like to continue, please, Madam President, with your permission. My two responses are that the matter had not been raised before. And my second response is that you may be as brief as you can, and it will not set a precedent for those to follow you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. On that note, Madam President, I'll leave what I was speaking about the constituency on, and I'll start my budget debate. In fact, the work that I'm doing speaks very loudly, so I don't need to come to the nation and talk about what's taking place in the constituency. we we'll leave it at that. This is a vision of the Senate. Yes. Thank you, sir. We, let's we forget that in that Senate, for the president of the Senate, it's also a learning experience. She's new and she's learning. Senator Andrew Lewis is a veteran in the Senate and he brought to light the laws and the rules of the Senate. She accepted and she put it to you. You wanted to continue because a, pre a precedent was, set, was already set. It's wrong. Why continue if because others did it, you must get the chance to continue it. You see the arrogance. Anyhow, we say his work speaks for itself. Story done. You don't need to come here and talk about, uh, uh, to go to the Senate and talk about what he's doing because his work speaks for itself. Let's move on the trip to Cuba. The Prime Minister and the delegation of 12 went to visit the Republic of Cuba to mark the 45th anniversary of the cuba grenada relation. The delegation flew to Havana on Thursday, April the 11th and returned home on Sunday, April the 14th, 2024. The Foreign Affairs Minister, Joseph Andel, Health Minister Philip Tellisford, Economic Affairs, Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries Minister, uh, Lennox Andrew, and Minister of Education, David Andrew, of course, with the Prime Minister and Minister of Infrastructure, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, were members of the team. It was 13 of them. We had, I might I say, Minister of, I don't know, Creative Minister and Advisor to the Government to the Prime Minister, Mr. Orlando Romain, was also part of the team. I see him as one of the only outsiders taking photos with the cabinet members. I'm assuming maybe 
He's an honorary member of the cabinet. Uh, in the meantime, we were left with Andy Williams, again, to act as prime minister in the interim. We were told in a GIS release dated April the 13, 2024, the delegation would be available for interviews at the uh, with the media on arrival at MBA, MBIA, Morris Bishop International Airport on Sunday the 17th of April, 2024 at 3.15 p.m. We we're gonna hold a press conference. Let's look at this clip of the arrival of the delegation from Cuba. Question for the Prime Minister. Is Ron Redhead a member of the cabinet or not? Is everywhere the cabinet members are? What was he doing on the tarmac of the MBIB? And then on Monday, he was seen visiting the mental hospital along with all the other cabinet members that is on island. If you look at the photos, you'd see Ron up front and personal. These guys are play play guys. They have nothing, nothing to do, no work to do, it seems. And 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 so we have no no reason to wonder why we stuck. And nothing seems to be happening, and our economy seems to be taking a nose dive. Five of them was away in Cuba. Five of five ministers and members of cabinet was away in Cuba. The prime minister was in transit. He overnighted and he left the next day for, for Greece. The other four, the morning after, the Monday, the same day the prime minister left, pick up themselves and went to the mental hospital, making Papi show with Delma and Andy. And the others just there, gone to sit up the cabinet, the entire cabinet that was on island, including, including Ron Redhead. And I say including because I read a little piece of the of the release they, they made. The Grenada Cabinet of Ministers is presently conduct, conducting an official visit to the Monge Hospital in St. George. During this visit, they are engaging with key nursing, medical, and administrative staff. We have a minister of, of, of Monge Hospital, right? The acting prime minister, if you want to say he accompany her, he can because he don't have nothing else to do. Enough painting for now, and there's nothing happening where he can say he is implemented. Right? What the others, big men and women, need to do showing up at the Monge Hospital trips in along behind Andy and, and Delma. That cannot be told when you have a cabinet meeting, a report from the minister. Why you need to go to talk to nurses and ad administrate? 
they have nothing to do. Real play play, doll house, dolly house, daddy and the children. Now, to the press conference. The media was invited down to the NBIA to witness the arrival of the press conference. As announced, here's a clip of the Prime Minister at the press conference. The three-day uh, meeting in Cuba uh, involved a number of meetings. Uh, the meetings ranged from a full-fledged meeting with His Excellency Miguel Diaz Bermudez, President of Cuba. We also met with the Prime Minister of Cuba. We met with the Foreign Minister and other senior cabinet members of Cuba, as well as senior uh, officials of the Cuba Communist Party. The delegation also had the opportunity to visit uh, significant institutions in Cuba. Many of these institutions tell the history, the struggle, the success, and the triumph of the Cuban people, and how that success has not just benefited Cuba, but has benefited Grenada, CARICOM, and the world. As you are aware, Grenada has a significant bilateral relations with Cuba, and uh, we cooperate in a number of areas. The ministers who accompanied me to Cuba uh, did so because of the particular areas of interest uh, that we have cooperated with Cuba over the years. Uh, the highlight of the visit included the signing of four bilateral cooperation agreements, and we will provide greater details on these uh, during the coming week. Uh, we anticipate further agreements to be signed, including uh, with later this month uh, when the Minister for uh, Culture and Tourism visits Cuba. But I just want to highlight a, a couple of things. One, uh, we visited Santiago de Cuba uh, just before arriving back from Grenada. Uh, Santiago boasts as being the most Caribbean of, of Cuba. Uh, and there are a number of significant uh, issues arising out of the, that visit. And I would perhaps say the most significant being this. As you are aware, there isn't a single statute or bus in tribute to or fallen former Prime Minister, the Morris Bishop, Morris Bishop in Grenada. Uh, but at the Casa de Caribe in Santiago, there stands a beautiful statute or bus in tribute to Morris Bishop. We had the opportunity to meet uh, with the son of the sculptor uh, that operates a foundation and a company uh, that has significant experience and expertise in the creation of bus. We engaged in discussions surrounding uh, commissioning a bus to represent Morris Bishop and the 18 colleagues who were killed on the 19th of October 1983 uh, to be done by the sculptor and his foundation. And so we anticipate that uh, before October 19th, 2024, that we'll have a bus of Morris Bishop together with the 18 colleagues who fell. Okay, so we expect a bust of Morris Bishop and his fallen soldiers and, and, and um, the 18 of them to get to Grenada before Heroes Day, October 19, 2024. Hint, hint, hint. I say no more. Anyways, the other ministers were not allowed to speak on that on the airport. Um, we were supposed to have a press conference to tell us what happened in Cuba, but they, they have to be, they can only speak when they are told to. They can only speak when they are allowed to. Uh, that is bothering quite a few of them, I'll, I'll have you know. Um, the media, of course, had no questions because um, what are we going to ask? How large is the bus? To, um, who are the 18? I don't know. They know that already. And... Um, who the 18 are, and so they had no questions to ask. They took the media from their homes, from their families, brought them down to the international airport, to the MBIA on a Sunday to tell them about um, a bust of an of Morris Bishop and the 18 that fell. Um, 
they said the, the, he, he announced that the others on the delegation will speak to us during the week, um, the, the, the week. And indeed they did. Um, on Tuesday, the 16th of April, the, um, the rest of the delegation, that is the ministers and that who attended, they spoke to us. Um, next week, we will talk about the MOUs and, and what they sign and stuff. Um, because we need to time to go through this. We are already running out of time. We are running out of time. At that press conference, the question was asked to the foreign minister concerning the diplomatic appointment of Sylvester Qualis as High Commission to Ottawa, Canada. That was rumored, because I've heard of it. Minister Andel, after, after going around the bushes, announced, yes, that Qualis being appointed. You have to listen well to figure out that he's saying that Sylvester Qualis is appointed um, High Commission in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Now, Sylvester Qualis is a retiree, probably in his late 60s, and, and more than likely, just averaging from what I know. Now, I'm not being insensitive here, but he's also very, very he's, he's ill. He has, he's a bad diabetic. He's been in and out of hospital. We know that. We, I, I send him best wishes when he's there. Um, he's not qualified or experienced in foreign policies or international relations. We were told that they wanted, that is the administration, um, career diplomats had over some 3,000 applications. What happened to these applications? Huh? Now we're hearing, oh, some countries, um, a lot, all, all, a lot of countries in the world do hire politicians. They might hire a politician, but a politician who is also qualified and experienced in foreign affairs. The importance of that office, as you said, Minister, because it's the capital and we have to show ourselves the capital of Canada. It's going to be a new office, and you put in someone who needs to learn on the job again, learning on the job. Here's the clip of Minister Andel on to the point. Talk floating around that the name is Sylvester Qualis. It has been floating around as a new high commissioner. Um, is there any? Is that correct? Is there? Is, is, uh, if so why? Why him? Well. Since you must have one, <laughs> why not him? Okay, agreeable. So. Yes, yeah. and in um, the appointment of diplomatic representatives, you generally go either the career route, yes, where you get someone from within the the foreign service mm -hmm. who has background and experience in diplomacy and protocol etiquette and things like that. So, negotiate negotiating skills. Or you go the political route, and every country has a mix of the career diplomat and the political appointees. Yeah. We have taken the the position in this government to promote as much as possible a professional foreign service. We have had several training opportunities. We have had people express their interest in um, taking up diplomatic positions, and. A number of our appointees, whether they be ambassadors or uh, people serving as consulars or first, <coughs> pardon me, first or third secretaries. Yeah, sure. Take that drip of water there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A number of them have come from those expressions of interest. Mm -hmm. And in the mix, we have had a couple of political appointees. Right. But our thrust is to form a cadre of professionals, of career diplomats, so that down the road we get to a stage where even if the administration changes, because you know you're dealing with <coughs> professionals, then 
You, you maybe need to grab that, that, that drink of water yeah. again. I understand how it feels sometimes. Mm-hmm. Hey, folks, it's classic radio GB TV. It's to the point with me this morning. We have Minister, <coughs> of course, Ms. Andal, of course, uh, to handle with us this morning. Yes, continue on the point you have. Ms. Andal, you're a good friend. You don't go down too, it don't go down too well with you when, when you're not telling the truth. It, it, you, least we forget. Least we forget. <laughs> now, in our case, I believe that the first controversy came about because of, I wouldn't even call it a misunderstanding. A couple of Wednesdays ago, I was engaged at the parliament in a meeting of the House Committee. Right. Prior to that, I had an engagement with the Chinese ambassador. Mm-hmm. And immediately following the House Committee meeting, the Prime Minister and I hosted a press conference. Right. So what happened then is that while I was engaged and virtually incommunicado for that period, mm-hmm. our ambassador in Brussels had signed mm-hmm. the agreement. Right. So in response to a reporter's question, I had said, no, we had not signed. Mm-hmm. That being based on knowledge and information I had up to that point, it transpired that I was wrong. Mm-hmm. I take full responsibility for that. There was nothing sin- <coughs> but sinister. <coughs> Yeah. 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 The throat is getting a little dry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we we'll get some water. Yeah. There was, sorry. Yeah. There, there was nothing sinister about that. It was yeah. just a question that I had not yet yeah. received. Yeah. No, no worry. Uh, we get some. We get mm-hmm. a little bit of water. We we'll just take a short break um, at this time and uh, come. Bring, bring the water. Bring the water. Career diplomats, Mr. Anders. And if you're going to use a politician, it's supposed to be a well-rounded politician, not a retired, sickly, and one who don't know nothing, nothing about foreign affairs and international relations. Besides age and health and credentials, or lack thereof, Sylvester Qualis, is the chairman of the NDC party and the chairman of the board of directors of gravel and concrete. Now the chairman of a party is one of the most important role of a party, right? Right up there with the political leader. The chairman should play an important role in strategies to recruit and retain members in campaign fundraising and internal party governance presiding over the National Executive Council, the NEC. Now that would be a good space to be filled by nation builders. Sending Qualis away to Canada, a means of getting rid of one of the oldest and true NDC member of the National Executive Council. Again, as I say, making room for nation builders to infiltrate the NEC of the NDC. Mr. Ander, was Sylvester Qualis your pick as Minister of Foreign Affairs? Who picked Sylvester Qualis? At this 99th hour, another learner on, on the job, learning on the job experience, Paul Grenada. Is it true that the appointment that Qualis holds in Ottawa, Canada, or will be holding in, in Ottawa, Canada, was the appointment offered to Senator Jonathan Lecrae in an effort to get rid of him from the cabinet? Is it true? Minister Lecrae said, hell no, I'm not going. Is it true that is why he was demoted to the Ministry of Youth and Sports, or so you thought he was being deported. Is it true that unlike Andal, Lacrette was not prepared to take the fall? And so he told anyone who asked that he knew nothing about the renting of the stadium, the athletic stadium, to the promoter for the reggae fest. 
Is it true that didn't go down good with you at all, Prime Minister? We now know that it was the Prime Minister, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, that slowly gave the permission to the promoter for the use of the athletic stadium to stage the reggae fest, the reggae concert that went two weeks ago. Is it true La Cred is about to make way for Ron Redhead to return to the cabinet? Is it true that's why Ron is acting like he never left? What happened to his studies? Is it true the former chairperson of the original Cam uh, Cannabis Commission turned in her resignation because she refused to go along with corruption. Is it true that some members of the government are involved in cannabis corruption and that the rights of the industry has already been given to someone? Can we, the people, get an update on the MSME program to show what the $300,000 was used for? And I'm talking about everyone who got that money. Let's see some success story. We asked for, um, for, from it for says we want to see some success story from the MSME, what they did with the 300, it's almost a grant, 1% paying back. Can the minister of MIT, now acting prime minister, tell the nation what he did with the $300,000 given to him through the MSME program, what it was used for, where is the business he developed with it? Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell, couldn't you tell us, sir, that you had issues with the contractor for the Calvini Main Road project, and that the Easter weekend and the character games had nothing to do with the pushback. The games are over. You promised us that it would the, the work would start on the first, the second, on the second of April. We're coming down to the end of April. Come to us, clean, and tell us what's going on with the contractor for that project. Tell us. I will tell the nation next week if you don't tell us. Now, what you see here on your screen are recipients of the seed program lined up at the stadium to receive their monies. Yes, Wednesday, the 17th April, 2024. Pay attention to the date. Why am I showing you this or bringing this to you. I don't know, with the seed people that line up, they used to line up on the carinade. They now bring them in the back of the stadium. Listen to this clip. But we also want to address the manner in which the seed program is used to disrespect and dehumanize our citizens. And only today, when leaving the revenue office in St. David, in the hot sun, door closed, you have 40 of our citizens standing up on a step Line up in the hot sun, waiting to receive this assistance. In 2022, you were telling me that our government can't deposit these monies directly to the People's Bank account so that they don't have to go through this. You are telling me, particularly for older citizens who may not be mobile, that you can't have field officers delivering the monies to their homes. That is what our citizens go through. Sometimes they made to go to a bus stop in Coles Gap and stand up in the bus stop and a bus shows up and hands out the money to them so that all of John public must know that you're getting government assistance. And if you're getting and the neighbor ain't getting, it brings enmity between you and the neighbor because why are you getting and I ain't getting? That is how the seed program is used. To divide, to conquer, and to dehumanize our citizens, particularly our older citizens. And so I can assure the citizens of Grenada, that we will not do that to you.
Prime Minister, you know that is not true. That is not what the SEED program is about. Divide, conquer, and dehumanize. Oh, come on. What, what, what's happening now? Look, look at them. Look at them. Let's hear you on another clip. Empowering the beneficiaries of the SEED program. Mr. Speaker, this government will introduce a cashless system of payment of the support for education, empowerment, and development benefits to eligible beneficiaries. Our elderly and other beneficiaries will no longer have to stand in long lines at the front of the Treasury and the District Revenue Offices. Fantasy Island, foot and mouth disease, full force. And then there is Sister Glow. Not sure if she even understand or understood what they gave her to be. January 2024. Seed benefit card. Madam President, a major milestone in improving the architecture of the seed program will be the introduction of the seed benefit card. Negotiations were conducted with the Grenada Cooperative Bank, and I'm happy to report that an agreement was signed in this regard. The implementation process will commence in January 2024. Madam President, beneficiaries will receive a seed benefit card, which will enable them to receive benefit through the banking system. We saw the need to improve the current payment mechanism, which led to long lines in inhumane condition with limited alternative options. This card will enable beneficiaries to receive cash transfer directly to their bank account the card will include all the features of a transactional card, such as ATM withdrawal and point of sale purchases. The card will increase the security of the elderly walking around with the cash. <laughs> Sister Glow, did she say January 2024 and they already have an agreement, a signed agreement with the Grenada Cooperative Bank? And they give them the card? And they have to go in the bank. Do they have or all have accounts? Are you opening accounts for them and managing their accounts? And when the bank decides to take out their fees on the people, a little bit of money already done small already, who's going to be responsible for that? Eh? But oh, pie in the sky, pie in the sky, folks. I leave you with pie in the sky so if i stand here without the document without the computer and i come to you and i say the national democratic congress intends to ensure that there is at least one health center in every parish that operates 24 hours a day and that there is at least one pharmacy either connected to the healthcare center or a private pharmacy that operates 24 hours a day in each parish and you like the idea and you clap. Will you call it a pie in the sky idea? I won't clap and I will call it a pie in the sky idea because it is. Folks, that's a wrap on today's episode of Simon Says. It was a pleasure as usual conversing with you, keeping them honest. Thank you for joining us at Simon Says, where facts come first. See you next week, same time, same place as we continue another episode of Simon Says. Have a great week. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode.